Welcome back. This is lesson three in our ESMBD statistical review training. Today we are going to go over sub requirement E333D. What does that mean? Today we're going to talk about checking calculations. Now, this is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite topics because I am, you know, in heart and soul, a dweeb, a math stat, and I love calculations and I love equations. And aren't we lucky that we're required to check these things in report review? Um, you'll notice here I've listed out several items from your statistical review checklist. There's a lot of things that we need to check, but they all come back to statistics that we are presenting correct. So that's what we'll go through today. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is equation and computation checks. So what are you looking for? You've got some equations, you've got some computations, what do we need to check? First of all, some obvious stuff. You're gonna look for arithmetic or derivation errors. They gave you the work, you're gonna check the work as much as you can. We'll get to that in a minute. Second, if this is an estimate from a survey, then the estimation, the statistic methods need to account for the sample design as applicable. And again, we're going to talk about this more as we go through this lecture, but you're going to need to account for the sample design if you're estimating from a sample. Finally, do the estimates reference or account for sampling errors? For example, going back to this sample design, are we providing measures of statistical uncertainty and appropriate formulae or references? So in other words, if it's a sample survey and we're computing a statistic from a sample survey, as applicable, we're gonna to need to show that if it's a point estimate, it's got uncertainty due to sampling error, and we're gonna to need to talk about how those sampling errors are computed. Now, just before I jump ahead of myself, I'm gonna mention that you don't always need to provide the formula for those. You can, if you have, however, a good source and accuracy with a methodology statement, and you're using, for example, the same variance estimates and variance estimator as is used in the actual survey, as long as you have a reference to that, you are okay. So we're getting into this gray area. You can't, however, just say, here's some standard errors, and here's an estimate. You really have to give some source of how these things are computed. Non-sampling errors. Um, if you know of measurement error, then you should point that out. Um, missing data treatment, weight adjustments, imputation, that should be mentioned as well. Going real quickly back to this measurement error, it becomes a big issue, for example, if you change the way that you're collecting a particular item. If you had an old form and it defined, say, sales a certain way, and now you're collecting data on sales and you have a different definition, there's gotta be a reason for that. And there is gonna be some source of measurement error because you change the definition and the respondent may or may not know that. So that's an example. There's lots of other measurement errors though that you might want to bring up. So what are you, the reviewer, checking? Well, an obvious one, are the formulae that they provided correct? If they provided derivations, are they correct? If derivations are not provided, can the author support his, her, or their claims? And finally, are there obvious errors in these computations that must be corrected? There's a smell test here. If the statistic doesn't look right to you, you can say, this doesn't look right to me. I tried to check it by hand, I couldn't. I need to see how you did this. Again, I always feel the best way to learn is by example. So let's look at this particular uh, example. I'm going to give you a second to read it. And our question here is, is this red equation correct? OK, anybody in the group want to raise their hand? What looks kind of funky about this? Well, look at that part on the right hand side in brackets right here. It could give a negative variance estimate. It cannot possibly be correct. For all of us who know and love variances, what needs to be done to make this equation correct? You got to correct it. The differences have got to be squared. So this is um, a no-brainer in terms of review. You cannot 
let this paper out, but it's an easy correction. Kudos to you for catching this error. All right, let's talk about this one. In the paper, they say it can be shown at, and they provide you this formula. Now, luckily for everybody in here, this is actually something that we go through in MathStat 201. It's, the, it's a standard statistical sampling variance formula, and this is a shortcut. So you can check the claim for this. It can be shown that you check the claim and lo and behold, they were right. Phew, what a relief. Always try to get the answer yourself when you're given a formula, especially if they're claiming that something is true. If you can't get the same answer, then the author needs to provide proof that in fact, it can be shown that. I think I wanna make a point here. Suppose you can't get the same answer and the author can't provide proof. Well, now we have a little bit of a problem. If you can't get the same answer and the author can provide proof, you can check their math. You may notice that you were wrong. That's okay, it's a little humbling, but it doesn't hurt to double check someone's work. There's nothing that's lost in this being very scrupulous. So don't feel bad if you don't get the same answer because there's a good chance you caught an error and there's an equally good chance that you committed an error. And either way, it's a careful review. So that's a good thing. Okay. Now we're getting into the grayer area. And ironically, this is a much smaller paragraph, isn't it? So let's take a look at this. Where do you think the controversy is? All right, we've said we have an unbiased assignment of sampled units to replicates, and that's excellent. But then we make a claim that we have an unbiased estimator of the variance of an estimate of the total. After really careful reading, you notice that there's no citation for this result and there's no derivation provided. So the author is making a very strong claim about unbiasedness, but they're not supporting it in the text. How could they support it in the text? It's pretty easy. They can give you a citation or they can give you a derivation. It's that simple, one or the other, or if they wanna go crazy, they can do both. So you call the author and you say, I'm really sorry, but this is a very strong claim. And I'm really not sure that it's true. And I don't feel like going through the proof because you as the author have the responsibility of supporting this claim. And so the author gives you their equations. They say, look, this is how I came up with it. And they finish up with all these, you know, they, they do this derivation in the end. They say, if you look at it here, we end up with a random group variance estimate. And I have a citation that says that the random group variance estimate of Horvitz Thompson type total is in fact unbiased, QED. Now, if you can't come to the same conclusion, then you need to work with the author. One of you is wrong. In this particular case, I'm gonna say that you're fine, but if you work through this or you look at their proof and you say, ah, uh, there's some mathematical issue in here, I don't like it or I don't believe in Walter. Walter was, you know, an old dude. You're talking 1985, and we are now in the 21st century. I don't buy it. Then you're going to need to talk to the author a little bit more. One thing I should mention, if I haven't mentioned it already, it's possible that you both could be wrong. If there's a lot of disagreement between the two of you and you can't agree, well, you know what? This is one of these rare cases where you may need to escalate. Okay. Let's move on. So are these calculations correct? We have a table and we have a methodology on the left-hand side. So they have this new, they're testing two new data collection methods. So they randomly split the original probability, sam probability sample into three different treatment groups. So I want you to notice here that this is a probability sample and they randomly split it into three different treatment groups. And then they are now comparing the, through a regression we know this because they say table one presents the regression parameters by treatment group for the simple regression, linear regression of inventories on sales. So you are making notes and you say, okay, I have um, read this text carefully and it looks to me like the authors fit an ordinary least squares model for each treatment group, predicting inventories in the treatment group by sales and they've made some pretty standard assumptions. 
from a randomized split probability sample. They made some pretty standard assumptions and they use pretty standard um, analytical tools. Okay, well, we got some questions here. First of all, why on earth should we believe that this model appropriately describes the data? This is a linear regression. Don't see any mention between this first and second paragraph of any kind of analyses where they compared the um, sales to inventories to see if a linear regression might be appropriate. Second, how did they do it? And this is actually very important because it's a probability sample and that needs to be addressed in the modeling. So for example, if they had said, well, we compared the treatment, excuse me, we compared sales to inventories in each group using some kind of scatter plot and a linear regression appeared to be appropriate in all cases, that's great. Then they have to say, but this is a probability sample. So how do I account for that in my statistics? Because we all know that the ordinary least squares fit on a complex survey data are not going to be appropriate. They're not going to account for the unequal sampling and the variance estimate. Now, if this is a stratified, excuse me, if this is a simple random sample, not a stratified simple random sample, then I don't have to worry about it. But let's assume that it is not. Let's assume that this is some kind of typical um, establishment survey like we would see in the economic directorate. So we have either stratified sampling or some kind of probability proportional to size sampling. Regardless, we know that the simple random sample variance estimate that we would get from your standard statistical software would not be correct. We would have erroneous inferences. And that is of a concern because they have provided us with standard errors. And we know that those standard errors are unlikely to be right. It is okay if they say in the text, we used SAS proc survey reg to produce these regression parameters and st associated standard errors accounting for the complex sample design in the survey and using the software. That's fine. Uh, along the same lines, there are some R packages that they can use that account for complex survey designs as well. As long as they mention those R packages and that SAS survey or that SAS proc and they give you a reference, you don't necessarily have to check their work unless you think that their estimates are very, very, very strange, in which case you can ask the authors for their SAS code or their R code. These statistics seem to you to be a bit suspicious. That's fine. Ask them for their code and review their code. Don't just ask them for their code and not look at it, but look at it and check to see if you think it's correct. In the meantime, the takeaway from this is you as a reviewer can't review this table or analysis. In terms of the statistical review checklist, you're essentially done. This is a major revision. You have to see where these calculations came from. Okay, let's move on to tabulation checks. So we've talked about calculations. We've talked about checking the equations. Now I wanna talk about checking the numbers. We'll talk about this again in the next section when we talk about looking at figures and graphs as well. Um, obviously, in a figure and a graph or in a table, you want to make sure that the statistics computed are correct. Okay, so what are you looking for? Again, it's not that different. First of all, you're going to look for obvious errors. The second thing that you're going to look for is our measures of uncertainty provided as applicable. Talk about this again in a second, but you don't always need to provide a standard error or some measure of uncertainty. All right, let's talk about the easy corrections that you can look for in the paper. Number one, serious quality errors are noted in the paper. Um, I got, again get this major CVs, coefficients of variation greater than 30% for the majority of key estimates. This is not coming from me. This is coming from sub-requirement F1-6. So you have a really large CV for most of your estimates. That is a concern. You have very large standard errors um, with respect to your estimates. Not a good thing. Unit response rates below 60%. Item response rates. And actually, we're talking here about weighted item response rates, 
where you're weighting by some estimate, the total quantity response rate or the quantity response rates are below 70%. Those are issues. Again, it's not uh, a deal breaker, but if there are these types of issues with the um, data that they're looking at, it needs to be mentioned. Obvious addition subtraction mistakes in the tables. And this is a biggie. This one is huge. It happens all the time. Mismatches between the numbers and the tables and the cited values in the text. All, all the time, someone puts together a table, they write something up in the text. You'll notice that they talk about 70% at this particular statistic in the table, in the text, and it's 50% in the table. That has to be corrected. They are analyzing something. Either the table is wrong or the text is wrong, or of course both, but it has to be fixed. All right, so let's look at example six. Um, this is a, a fictional example that I made up that provides national and regional estimates of widgets along with their associated standard errors. So if we see anything wrong, I'll give everybody in my studio audience a chance to take a look at this. I'll give you exactly 50 seconds. So on your mark, get set, read. Or check. Okay, that was my timer, which tells me that we have had a minute to learn everything there is about this table or think about everything we need to correct. First thing you probably noticed in your minute is the regional estimates don't add to the total. It's an obvious error, which by the way, you can't correct. They need to correct that. All right, they have given you enough information that you can check some of the computations. Um, you can check to see if the standard errors appear to be correct. There's no obvious error here in the sense that if you square them, add them up and take the square root, you get this overall U.S. sum in the table. So that's kind of nice. Definitely a problem with the estimates, though. So you're going to need some statements in the text. If I haven't already belabored this enough, if this is a sample survey, and we're going to assume it is, they need to mention how they accounted for the sample design in these estimates. Um, if there was missing data, it would be helpful if they mentioned how that was treated in the estimates, whether it was weighting adjustments or imputation or neither. And they need to say how the standard errors are computed. Now, why is four different than two? Well, because you could account for you know, the standard the sample design in the estimates through weighting and you could account for the missing data treatments again through weighting or through imputation. And you can say that you accounted for the sample design and the standard error computations, but that's actually not enough. They need to tell you what method that they use to produce these estimates. Again, they can use a SAS procedure. They can give you, say we used a replicate variance estimator. We use this approximate formula variance estimator. Somewhere, however, it needs to be in the text and it needs to show you exactly how the sample survey design was accounted for in the estimates. Um, finally, the title or the footnote needs to indicate a source and a reference period of data. This just says widget production by region. It does not say where the data came from or for what period of time you're looking at. And that is a sneaky little reference. It's a st statistical review checklist item 5A. Always have to provide a source and reference period for um, data in tables and figures. Okay, one more thing that you might wanna notice is they gave me the estimates and they gave me the standard errors and therefore I can compute a z-statistic. Um, anybody know what the Census Bureau 
um, significance level is? Significance level is alpha equals 0.10. Out. So therefore, a z-statistic um, that is greater than 1.1645 is statistically different from zero according to our Census Bureau standards. Well, we have our estimates and we have our standard errors here. And as a reviewer, I can actually look at these z-statistics. And one thing I will notice is that I have a problem with the West in the sense, and of course, one of my numbers might be wrong, in the sense that my z-statistic is not different from zero. So one of the things that we're asked in statistical review checklist item 11 is, is the level of detail appropriate for the data? And this is actually a real gray area here because we have an estimate for the United States that's clearly significantly different from zero. And three of our four regions, we have estimates that are significantly different from zero. But we do have one of these four domains where we have a gray area, it's clearly not. So is this level of detail appropriate for the data? Um, and I have well here, should the issue be noted in the text? I would argue that the level of detail is appropriate for the data. Um, we could make some very clear statements in three of the four regions, but we can't in one of them. So it seems to me that the appropriate thing to do is to mention that we can't make any statements about the West. But we should note that, and especially if we start making comparisons between the regions. Now, there is no one size fits all for tables. I wish there were, it would make life a lot easier, but this is where the art and the science comes in. Um, for example, unit response rates. I keep talking about how you need standard errors, but you don't always need standard errors. If you're looking at this as a process control metric, if you're looking at it by period, by period, by period, to look at the proportion of all the sampled units that came from respondents, you don't need a margin of error. This is just a performance metric. On the other hand, if you are comparing response rates in an experiment by domain and you want to make statements about differences, you're going to need a statistical test. So it now becomes a contingency table. You'll need some kind of chi-square test for independence. So the answer for unit response rates is yes and no. It depends on how they're using them. Along the same lines, total quantity response rates or quantity response rates, again, as a process control metric, if you, you don't need a margin of error. It's a performance measure. How much of this particular estimate came from data that wasn't made up, that was reported, if it's a quantity response rate, or reported a, or considered equivalent quality to reported data if it's a total quantity response rate. You don't need a standard error. This is just a performance metric. It's just a compare, it's just a measure. However, if you want to talk about the average over adjacent periods, or you want to then you actually do need a measure of precision because now you're looking at something different. You're looking at an average. Tricky, right? It gets even trickier. Suppose you have measures like relative biases or stability measures of variance estimates or fraction of missing information. Well, it depends on the analysis. Again, if you're just talking about relative biases because you've done a simulation study and you're comparing a bunch of different estimators of the same thing to the truth. Do you need a margin of uncertainty? Probably not. Similarly, if you're looking at stability of variance estimates, variance of variance, if you're just looking at it for a one-time simulation study, probably not. Fractions of missing information, that would be more of a multiple imputation or a, um, it can be done with maximum likelihood, but that's looking at the proportion of unaccounted variance after imputation. Do you need a measure of, of variability there? Well, probably not, but you might, again, if you're doing some kind of comparison between two different methods. It depends on the analysis. So like, for example, Let's take a look at example seven. Here we have unweighted unit response rates broken down by collection mode for the quarterly services survey from the first quarter in January of 2009 to the fourth quarter of 2011. Do we need to convey any kind of measure of uncertainty? My answer would be absolutely not. This is a table of performance metrics. 
for each period, we have a unit response rate, which represents the proportion of the sample that came from respondents. And we have broken down that proportion by collection mode. And you'll notice here, these collection modes add up to the total unit response rate. There is absolutely no comparison in this table. These are straight computations that just literally break up this performance metric. And there is no discussion of any comparisons over time. So this table doesn't need anything else. And as a reviewer, the only thing I would ask you to do is spot check or spot check to make sure that these different percentages add up to the total. Now let's look at table example eight. Here we have relative bias of a multi, multiply imputed estimate of exotic produce, produce sales. Um, we've got everything here. They mentioned how the missing data was taken care of. It wasn't taken care of through imputation using the approximate Bayesian bootstrap. They have a reference. They tell you how many imputations and they produce this beautiful table for you. It tells you because it's relative bias, you're going to need a truth and you're going to need a bunch of samples. It tells you how many samples were included, 2000. It mentions that, how did we get response? We randomly induced 25% in of the respondents. It tells you the source of the input data from the survey of exotic products. It should probably tell you the year that we collected the survey of exotics, but that's not really what we're talking about and it's giving you a caveat. The totals used to compute the relative bias are not gonna to correspond to the published totals. It's probably because we are using multiple imputation and we didn't use that in the original survey. And we're doing this over 2000 samples with randomly induced unit response. So do we need to provide any kind of measure of uncertainty? Again, I would argue not. You have four different estimates. You have statistics on four different measures of relative bias. You can look at these measures and make an assessment that this multiple imputation procedure over repeated samples essentially gave you unbiased estimates of cannabis and coconuts if you had a 25% non-response rate. And we were not nearly as lucky with bananas and green tea. Um, you can argue that you don't think that bananas are exotic as cannabis, but that's really a separate issue in terms of a statistical review and not really relevant. So I would argue for this particular table that as long as you believe that the statistics were computed correctly, and again, we go back to an earlier slide, if you really don't believe that these were computed correctly, you can ask the author to show you their computations. You can ask them to show you your code and that's absolutely fine. However, if you have no reason to suspect that these statistics were computed incorrectly, then you don't need anything further. They've given you all the background information you need to know how they were computed and they haven't made any ridiculous comparisons. So I think you're good to go. Nothing's needed here. And on that note, it's time for you to um, use your judgment to do a little bit of practice here. So you can now complete exercise three. You've already read section one, you're gonna now read section two and complete section eight of the statistical review form. And then we're gonna do something a little bit stupid. You're gonna jump ahead and take a look at table one. And just by looking at table one, you and your team should be able to compute sections nine through 11 in the statistical review form. And if you're feeling frisky and want to do some extra stuff, go ahead and complete section 5D and section 5E of the statistical review form as well. And then when you're done, um, you can send that completed exercise into the training coordinator and you can go on to lecture lesson four. So happy reviewing.